Chapter 18 Come on, Mibs, said Will quietly, helping me up off the ground and brushing the dirt and gravel from my hands. Let's go. Everyone's waiting for us. He turned me away from the unconscious man, but Will didn't know what I'd heard. He didn't know what I'd seen. He could turn away easier than I could because he didn't have to listen. Weak-kneed and shaken, it seemed impossible for me to walk away. Yet, when Will took hold of my elbow awkwardly, I allowed him to lead me toward the glow of the Emerald Truck Stop Diner and Lounge. The others were waiting at the front door of the restaurant. Lester held the door open for each of us as we entered. Inside the diner, there were so many people, you couldn't stir them with a stick, and I understood bitterly exactly how wrong Rocket had been when he'd said that girls only got the quiet, polite savvies. Noise, noise, noise was all I'd gotten. When I stepped into that diner, it was most definitely not quiet, and some of the voices and thoughts jangling in my ears were far from polite. Walking into a diner full of tattooed bikers and truckers made me feel like someone had switched on a rosmatized radio inside my head, a radio with a dial that kept spinning with a fizz and a zing from station to station to station to station without stop. Still reeling from my encounter with a homeless, homeless man, the new added onslaught of all these strangers' thoughts and feelings and questions and answers made me feel like I was going to be sick. A wave of dizziness hit me, making the room lurch, and I stumbled, uselessly covering my ears and trying to stay upright. Fish caught me on one side as Will grabbed me on the other side, each boy glaring at the other, both trying to steady me and keep me on my feet. Ah, uh, jeez, said Lester, sticking his hands in his pockets and taking a step back. None too sure what to do about falling down girls. You okay, honey? Lil said to me, turning around and reaching out to help. She was ignoring a lady in a green and white uniform that matched her own. The other woman had red hair and a surly glower, and was trying to push pitchers of coffee and water Lil's way, complaining like a wet cat about Lil being late. I think my sister was just on that bus too long. Fish told Lil, nervous and hasty. Fish was trying to cover for me in my savvy, even though he was still unsure what exactly he was covering for. I was grateful to my brother, and ashamed. I knew that I was going to have to tell him everything, about the voices, and about how I'd gotten us all into this big mess for nothing. Well, maybe Mibs should lie down in the back room for a spell, said Lil. In several quick, long strides that the rest of us had to hop to keep up with. She led us past the piping and belly aching of the red-haired waitress, past the booths and tables filled with diners and their deafening thoughts. L Lil led us past a long counter where customers sat perched atop around spinning stools, eating their onion rings and drinking coffee, and took us through an employees-only door next to the kitchen. We found ourselves in a cramped storeroom that smelled like ketchup and pickles and mustard. Lil shrugged out of her sweater and hung it on a coat rack inside the door. Shelves stacked high with bread rolls, jars of mayonnaise, and enormous cans of beans and tomatoes lined the room, reminding me of our basement back in Mississippi and all of Grandma Dollop's noisy jars. Filing cabinets, a cluttered desk, and a battered sofa filled the only area without supply shelves. A pile of newspapers lay on the floor near a back door labeled Emergency Exit and there was a low table in front of the sofa, littered with crumbs and empty soda cans. A small black-and-white television sat on top of one of the filing cabinets, its antenna aslant and festooned with bows of crumpled aluminum foil. The TV was turned on, its poor, snowy image broadcasting the evening news. A newscaster was reporting from somewhere in Kansas, covering a story about freak power outages and damaged electrical grids that ran up and down Highway 81 on most of its path through Candace and into the town of Selena. Fish and I exchanged knowing glances, fairly confident that Rocket had something to do with these problems. Lil told Fish and Will to get me to rest on the sofa as she turned the volume down on the little TV, but I brushed off their orders like annoying buzzing flies. Just being in the back room helped. My head still hurt something awful. My stomach still wanted to jump and jive and do the twist. I could still hear all the voices, but tucked back in the storeroom, as I was, those voices were muted low now, like the TV. <clears throat> I, saw <clears throat> I sat on the edge of my... <clears throat> Sorry. I 
I sat on the edge of the frayed sofa cushions, staring at the floor and trying not to listen, trying to let all sounds, both inside and outside of my head, blend together into one endless, punishing roar, as I mourned the, mourned the loss of my hopes for my savvy, and for my papa. She just needs a little space, I heard Fish tell the others, above the din in my head. I really have to get to work, said Lil apologetically, linking her hand through Lester's arm, where he stood next to her. I may be in luck tonight, y'all. I didn't see the great and powerful Ozzy when we came in. She sounded relieved and laughed her small laugh, bumping Lester with her hip and nearly knocking him to the ground. Ozzy's the manager here, and he'd put a knot in my tail if he caught me coming in at this hour. Mr. Fish, why don't you stay with your sister? And I'll have the brother others bring you kidlings something to eat in a wink and a shake. Fish just nodded without looking away from me. Lil pulled Lester back out into the restaurant, and Bobby and Will Jr. followed after, Will casting a long and worried look over his shoulder, obviously reluctant to leave my side. I looked around for Samson. Where's... I started. Who knows, said Fish with a shrug. You know, Samson, he'll turn up. Pushing aside the empty soda cans and brushing off some of the crumbs, Fish sat down on the low table directly in front of me, and, patience worn thin, crossed his arms over his chest tell me. Fish wanted the full hokey pokey on my savvy. He wanted details. He wanted them now. Needing to look anywhere besides my brother's sullen face, I stared at the fuzzy images on the small TV screen across the room. There was so much static that it was like trying to watch television through soda pop bubbles. The sound was too low to hear. The story about the power outages ended and the anchorman behind the new desks knew Behind the new desk swiveled his chair to a new, more dramatic angle, looking doubly serious. A telephone number began marching herky-jerky across the bottom of the screen as the anchor anchorman moved his lips mutely. I didn't know what to tell Fish. I'd been so sure about my savvy. We wouldn't have been sitting there in the storeroom of the Emerald Truck Stop Diner and Lounge, if I hadn't been positive that I could bring Papa back home to us, back home to Kinsack and Abranzas, but it was now as clear as Mama's don't touch her else crystal that my savvy had different plans for me. And I was nothing but sorry and filled up with misery and dread at the thought of telling my brother. It's the ink fish, I finally said, still finding it easier to focus on the black and white fizz of the news report than to look my brother in the eye. What ink, Mibs? said Fish. Any ink, I think, as long as it's on someone's skin. Fish squinted at me. Go on. I didn't know how to explain. I didn't want to rummage through my mind for the right words and try to put them into the right sentences, like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. It felt too hard. I was too tired, and, and I was hungry. And now that I knew there was nothing, nothing, nothing I could do to help Papa, I just wanted to go home. Home to Grandpa Bamba. And home to Gypsy. Home to the mud left behind by Fish's rain. Home to be homeschooled and grow moss and pickle jars and learn how to scumble this savvy and make it know its place. Tell me, Mibs, Fish demanded. I tore my eyes away from the little TV where a reporter was interviewing a man and a woman who looked through the slaty static of the poor reception, a little like Pastor Meeks and Miss Rosemary. I met my brother stare inside again. Maybe I should just show you. I pulled the silver pen Will Jr. had given me for my birthday from the pocket of my skirt. Hold out your hand and think of a number. Any number. But make it a hard one. Fish drew his eyebrows together, looking wary. What are you going to do, Mibs? It's not a hurricane, Mibs. Fish. It's not a hurricane, Fish, I said impatiently. It's not dynamite. Trust me. Fish thrust his hand toward me stiffly, his lips pressed together into a tight, straight line. I could tell I'd made him mad. My hair blew back from my face, and the newspapers by the door rustled and fluttered. I placed the tip of the pen to the skin of Fish's palm, and then stopped. Are you thinking of a number? I asked him sharply, because I don't want to hear anything but a number. The last thing I wanted to hear was what was going on inside my brother's head. I shivered. Gross. Fish squinted at me again and nodded, all curt and serious and grumpy. I've got a number. Just think it to yourself over and over, I said. And I pressed the pen down to draw a small, quick circle 
punctuating with the eyes and mouth of a smiley face that wasn't smiling so much as not smiling. The mouth of the face rippled like a grimace, and the eyes blinked twice. 2,222 and a half, it said. 2,222 and a half. 2,200... I spit quick on fish hand, Fish's hand and smear the face away before Fish's thoughts had the chance to wander somewhere else. Fish didn't move, but just sat looking at me like I was some kind of whack of a quack fortune teller at the county fair, reading his palm and telling him how many squalling, bawling children he was going to have when he was grown up. 2,222 and a half, I repeated. Right? Fish gave me a hard-boiled nod, looking grave but unruffled. You can hear what I'm thinking? Thinking or feeling, I guess. So, you read minds, do ya? A sing-song voice broke out above the droning roar and hummed inside my head. Bobby was just standing just inside the storeroom, looking as though she was about to drop her armful of plastic baskets, all overflowing with burgers and fries. So you read minds, do ya? 